So I'm going to be your speaker today, and I have about 45 minutes. I promise I'm taking more than that. And then when I'm done, um, everything up here, th these are my displays, mainly photos, and then I have a lot of records, uh, marriage records, death records, probate, wills, um, land purchases, those kinds of things, Civil War records. So we have someone from the 102nd here. I have some ancestors who are in that as well. So I'm going to get started then. So what are we going to cover today? So obviously a little bit about me, since I'm your speaker, we're going to uh, learn a little bit about me. Why did I do this? Why did I spend 20 years researching my family's history, which was here in Cass County, and, and we're going to go into the South as well. Um, talk a little bit about my uh, Calvin ancestors, and I say Calvin, for those of you who aren't familiar, Calvin Township is one of the Cass, uh, or Cass County townships that uh, we're talking about today, that were the Underground Railroad, um, had homes here, as well as a lot of free people of color that came from the South that had been freed for in some cases hundreds of years even um, during the time of slavery. So we'll talk about their life in the South, why they left the South, as you'll see there's, there's quite a good reason that a lot of the free people of the South, the blacks and uh, Indians, uh, mulattoes, they left um, because of the conditions that were there. I'm going to share a lot of stories and documents and some photos. And then I'm also going to talk about you know, how I did this. Uh, this. I started in 89 and it took me forever, it took me about 20 years to get all the stuff I have. Uh, and I'll talk about how much easier it is to do now if you are interested in family history and you want to do your own history with the internet, Ancestry.com, those kinds of things. It makes it way easier. So I, I wasn't born here, I was born in Ann Arbor. Um, and I started my life out on the southwest or southeast side of Michigan. But I did come here in third, uh, third grade and have lived, or I lived here from third grade until I graduated, which was 1986 in Cass High School. So my mom is here in the, the orange here. My brother Scott, his wife, my wife, have some family here. So I'm the second son of, of Pat uh, Pompey, uh, now Aloysio, and my dad, um, Thomas James Kovalak Sr. Uh, two brothers, Eric and Scott, so that's, that's my mom. Beautiful mom back in the 60s, my dad, and some pictures of, uh, there's a picture of me in the high school band, and you can tell I'm holding that, that hat when I had a lot of hair, too. <laughs> so, um, all those pictures I had hair, but, okay. So, again, why did I spend 20 years doing this? There are, you know, some people, uh, even in my own family, and, and nothing against them, but the, you know, it wasn't a big interest to them when I started doing family history. And it isn't to a lot of people, but to me it was. It was very interesting and very important. So, you know, when I saw Roots back in 77 when it came out, I was fascinated about that story and, and what Alex Haley was able to find, even back then when I was only nine. But I saw it again in 88 as an older, First, as a 20 year old, I said, okay, you know, if you did that, why can't I do the same thing? So, then another thing I, I thought was interesting is what I say the, just the uniqueness of my family. A lot of people who are in this room who are from Calvin or from that area have a very unique story as well. So, even my father is from an ethnic minority um, in Eastern Europe. They're, they're called the Carpatho Rusins, that they're in Slovakia, Poland and uh, Ukraine. So knowing what my father was, that my mom as well, her, her racial background, it was very interesting to me and I wanted to find out more. So as I say here, my family on my mom's side um, are actually English, as you'll see all the last names that I'm going to cover, all English last names. So that would be the, the white or Caucasian side, and then the American Indian side, and then um, African slaves as well that were, that were brought over. Um, unlike, you know, if you ask a lot of people if they have Indian ancestry, they say yes, and it's always Cherokee, right? Even though there's 500 nations of, of Indians in the United States, everybody's Cherokee. Well, my ancestors were not Cherokee, but see, most people probably never even heard of these tribes, the Pony, Tudalo, Tuscarora, Okanichi. Those are tribes in Virginia, in North Carolina, that still exist to some extent. Some of them are federally recognized as well as state recognized. And you see those names, Chavis, Hunt, Oxendine, Bass, Rebel. Those are families that were here in Calvin. They're definitely Lumbee Indians. In fact, if you go to either of those websites, you look at the people who live in South Carolina, North Carolina, they look like they're right from Cass that were transplanted down there. The same exact look of, of people here are down in those counties as well. Plus, I just have an uh, interest in history in general, US history. I like the colonial period, antebellum period, Civil War era, so very interested in that. So another reason why I did it, 
uh, I, I consider myself, I have a detective streak, I'm able to search through things, find the, the details, and as you'll see, if you look at some of the stuff I have, and this is just a fraction of what I have, um, I, I was able to find a lot of information. And I have, I basically had an addiction, so I was telling some people at the beginning of this, before we started, I would spend eight hours in the library all day long just going through microfilms, again, before the internet, looking for one family member on one page from 17 whatever. So, um, can get addicted to it fairly easy, but again, as we'll talk about near the end, you don't have to spend the time that I did to get here. So, I'm going to show a lot of uh, records, and again, when it's done, have a look and see what I have. You'll probably see some names of yours in there if you're from this area. And again, we're going to talk about the tri-racial, as I said in my title. Uh, definitely not just uh, black or white or Indian, they're all three in a lot of cases. And my family, uh, except for well, just two last names, basically I could not find any slave ancestors because the further I would go back, you can't hear it. Okay. Yeah, that's right. So I'll put the mic. Hello? Okay. So um, my family had been living free in southern states, slave holding states, in the 1600s, 1700s, 1800s. And in some cases, my ancestors, who were not white, had slaves of their own. And in some cases, quite a few of their own slaves. Um, there was racial prejudice on all sides. So again, uh, you know, it's kind of a touchy subject. But uh, because of the very light skin uh, color of a lot of the people from Calvin, there was definitely racial prejudice against darker skinned people. And you'll, if you notice photos, especially from the 1800s, the, the people were a lot lighter than they were now in the 1900s and the 2000s as they kept their, their race, the people who were in Calvin, very much like themselves. Um, and we're going to talk about, again, the, the path they took out of the South and into the North and why they did it through the, the Quaker network and the Underground Railroad routes. Most of what I was told was wrong, and I think you'll do the same thing if you're doing your own genealogy when you ask grandma or grandpa, you know, who was, our, who was your great-grandfather? And they'll tell you, but uh, I would say almost everything I was told was wrong. It has some ring of truth to it, but it's just when you hear a story, it's passed on, and then it gets deluded. Um, you know, one of my ancestors, Peter Day, was supposedly from Ireland, and his family had been here for generations before him. And again, anyone in here can do the same thing, except for a fraction of the time that I spent. Okay, so let's talk about the names. And again, some of the people I recognize here will have some of these last names for sure. Um, and these are the names of a lot of the settlers. So when you look at, if you go back to an 1850 census, and you look at Calvin Township or uh, Penn or Porter Townships where the mixed race settlers were, there's only so many last names. And I'm going to, I have seven of them, obviously. So here we go. And again, all these names do originate from England. So you have Pompey, which is what my mother is. Uh, Dungy, again, a very common name. Uh, you know, the football coach, right, of the Colts. Uh, Archer, Dennis Archer, who was the mayor of Detroit for years. He's you know, a distant cousin of mine through a, a, my four-time great-grandfather, his three-time great-grandfather. Rickman, Hawks. And the original spelling of Hawks was with an E, even though all the Hawks in Cass County do not use the E. But it, it definitely was. That is the, the correct spelling. I have some wills from the 1800s when some of the Hawks in Nottoway County, Virginia, gave their freedom to the Hawks that eventually came up here. Newsom's Polly. Again, that name is not quite as common. There was only a few, but there are there were some Pollies here, especially in the 1900s. And then Day, which Day Lake Road, Day Lake, that's the event for one of my ancestors. Okay, so we'll talk about in the south. So I'm going to go by surname and to the farthest one I could trace definitively. So in other words, you get to a county and census records and you find that you have a relative, but then you go back 50 years later, you see someone with that same name that I can't say, oh, this guy was this guy's father. So I went back to the ones I could trace on my family tree. So Solomon Day. Um, he was the son of a, a black or, and I don't know for sure, or mulatto slave, and a white woman who was possibly an indentured servant. So he was born in 1788 in uh, Southampton County, Virginia, which is the same county as the Nat Turner Rebellion. If anyone knows about that, uh, that's good. If you don't, you will, because I'm going to talk about 
Um, and then he married Ann Barnville of Pennsylvania. And this point is very uh, common in my family's history where we a lot of children took the status of the mother. So a lot of the people who, or in flower, uh, a lot of the people who had, um, who came to this town, this area, they were original, so go back in the 1600s and 1700s, they were children of a white mother and a mulatto or black father. They took the status of their mother and then basically were never slaves. They were free the rest of their lives and all their children. Samuel Hawks, uh, I'd say one of my most famous ancestors, famous of Cal Calvin at least. I mean, he's on the cover of the book over there, about 200 years under freedom, the Booker T. Washington wrote when he came to Cass back in 1902. Um, and my uh, four times great grandfather was on the cover of that. He was the, actually the richest person in Calvin Township back in those days. So, uh, and he was born a slave in Virginia. Uh, only until he was about nine and got his freedom. But uh, still, to come from slavery to having over 500 acres of land, lots of homes and the properties, it's a pretty cool story. Richard Dungey, again, that's a common name here. He was Indian, English, and African, born in Virginia, 1794. And then his wife, Nancy Penn, was born in Virginia in 1800. Lemuel Archer, again, the Archer name I was talking about. And one thing about Lemuel Archer, I actually have, and you can look at it if you want later, but, and I have other ones, but I have a copy of his free paper. This is from 1831. He had to carry this around, living in the South could be captured and sold back into slavery. Even though he never was a slave, and his parents weren't slaves, but still it was, it was something that could have happened. If you know, again, in 1847, there was the Kentucky slave raids that happened here in Calvin, where uh, Kentucky slave catchers came here, and they did capture some people, uh, many who had, had been free and not slaves, but they tried to sell them, uh, took them to court, and they lost, and they had to go back to Kentucky with nothing. That's a very good story. John Rickman, again, uh, all, you can see everybody that is in my family comes from two states, Virginia and North Carolina, and all right near each other. The counties that touch on the southern border of Virginia and the northern border of North Carolina. Fielding Pompey, so this is my oldest Pompey ancestor. Even though I have lots of Pompey research from the county that they lived in in the early 1700s, mid 1700s, but I can't definitively say who Fielding Pompey's dad was. This guy, he was born in, uh, I have his year, but he was born in um, 1799, I think. Um, so I just, just don't have those records, unfortunately, I wish I did. Then the Benjamin Hall, he was the one I could trace back the farthest. Um, I, I could go back to 1735 on him. So again, uh, you know, George Washington would have been a youngster uh, back then. And, and he was actually a, one of the slave-owning ancestors I had, even though he was a mixed race himself. And then Thomas Newsom, oh yeah, he's the one, sorry. Uh, I went back to 1685, so back to the early colonial period on him, and I have a lot of stuff on the Newsoms. So, what was life like down there? So I, I went, uh, again, this is years ago, but trying to figure out why did they all leave? You know, if they are free and they have homes and they have land, why did they leave the South? Well, let's look at some of the laws that the legislators in Virginia and North Carolina passed, and I think you'll, you'll get an idea. So this goes way back. So again, I talked about blacks, mulattoes, Indians owning slaves. But even in 1704, they passed laws, well, if you want to own a slave, that's fine. This can't be lighter than you. And that literally was a law that was passed. And if you were a Negro, it says you couldn't have um, a slave, a, a white Christian slave, basically. So it just, I don't know how they sat and came about with these crazy laws, but they did. Um, they couldn't have weapons, and they could get you know, 20 lashes for uh, fend, you know, breaking any of these laws. Next year, 05, Negroes, Mulatos, Indian slaves held within Virginia were to be held as real estate and could. Uh, they could, they could uh, inherit or give their land to their, their offspring, so they could still have some kind of decent life, but again, as you'll see these years progress, you'll see how things got tougher and tougher. So, 1723, you know, less than 20 years later, so they could not be set free except for meritorious, meritorious service. In other words, doing some great act, then the, the white owners could let them go. 
Uh, and as you can see, they also used to build a vote in the United States. Negroes, mulattoes, uh, free persons of color, they could vote, but that was abolished in 1723, and then, of course, didn't come back a couple hundred years ago. Um, and then, as, again, they progressed. Uh, they were considered personal property. Um, they had to re-register every three years. So a lot of records I have here and a lot of my, that I don't have on my computer or another my box of stuff over here, they had to register in the county they lived in as a free person. So you literally had to go into the county office and say, yes, I'm not a slave, I'm free. You had to get a white person to vouch for you that said, yes, I know that person is free and has always been free. You'll see, if you read some of the records, you'll actually see that wording on there. So um, they had to carry the law with them, and, and as I said, even with that free paper, it was not a fail-safe. If someone decided, especially a slave country, said, well, I can't read anyway, that's what that paper says, and they catch you and you're, you're a slave. You, know, you saw that movie, 12 Years a Slave, you can see that guy was born free, and yet was still put into slavery. So this is the, the free paper that I have, and this is my four times great-grandfather, Lemuel Archer. So it's hard to read that, but what it says here is State of North Carolina, Northampton County, March 21st, 1831. So I certify that I've known Lemuel Archer. Again, it had to be a white person who would certify that he knew them. The bearer of the certificate for several years have always understood him to be free and have every reason to believe he is. He has a wife whose name is Dolly, uh, which is her name is Dorothy, and six children, Jesse, Tabitha, Annie, Edie, which is Edith, that's my three times great grandmother. Bedford and Lemuel Jr., that's Dennis Archer's uh, three times great grandfather. So again, they had to carry this around with them. So I and these, so this record, this exists in North Carolina. They actually photocopied that for me. So I, you know, obviously, I asked for it, and they said, uh, "You and you know, a hundred other people are related to this guy too. You can't have it, <laughs> right?" So uh, and I knew they wouldn't give it to me, but I thought I'd ask. So again, we talked about why did they leave the South? So you. you we talked about some of those laws that were passed that made life kind of miserable for them. But then in August of 1831, in uh, Southampton County, Virginia, um, there was the, the, the uh, Nat Turner Rebellion. And that really is what set the, the stage for a lot of people uh, of color leaving the South and leaving it forever. So uh, this law in 1806 here that was passed, before I get that, it says that, in, this is um, actually Thomas Jefferson had a hand in this one, that all manumitted slaves must leave Virginia within 12 months of being free or risk being re-enslaved. Yeah. So they, they said, if you're free, you got to get out of here yes. within one year or you could be made a slave. Yeah. Uh, so that was obviously not good, especially for my family who had been, in some cases, already free 100 years. Um, and then just how they were treated, it didn't really, like, you've all heard of the one drop rule, right? Yeah. So it really didn't matter uh, what color you were, as long as you had some black in you, you were, or, or even Indian, you were not white, so you were going to be treated pretty much the same. But, so, August 21st through October 30th, 1831, Southampton County, which I do have ancestors from that county in that period of time, so Nat Turner, who was a slave, and then 75 others who were slaves and free, um, decided, uh, and if you read the story of Nat Turner, it's actually quite fascinating. He kind of thought of himself as a prophet, and he could see signs, had uh, got signs from God, and said he needed to kill the white people uh, in that county to get back at them, basically. And he did. They killed 60 um, men, women, and children. And in fact, I said, so these are some of the people who were part of the the mob who was doing who were doing the murders and a uh, Billy Artist and you name Artist and Artist is a is a common name especially back in the 1900s here in Calvin Thomas Heathcox and Barry Newsom they were all uh, they were all hung uh, hanged for murder but Billy Thomas they found him dead and believed he committed suicide so after that happened the white slave owners the white people of that county and all, all across the United States. Uh, started retaliating. A lot of uh, free black people, free mulattoes of all shades were, were killed. And then this really started the exodus. If you notice how the North started getting a lot of free black people or free people of color, it was after 1831. Again, some more laws that just made kind of like miserable. After This was passed in 1831 after this happened. So they couldn't uh, assemble at church, couldn't speak at church. 
Um, they were for, forbidden to hold religious services. Again, because they thought if they're having religious services, they can talk about what they're going to do the next time they want to you know, start killing us. Um, if, they, if there was any kind of unlawful assembly, which could be any kind of meeting, um, it could be considered insurrection, and those people could even be executed for that. So there's just a lot of things that got really bad after 1831, and then my family and a lot of others started heading north. So this is an old map from that time period. And really, the, the Quakers all start even kind of at the bottom here. So you've probably heard a lot of these names, the Benign, the Benign House, Sugar, Spokes, James, Osborne's. They were um, Quakers here in Calvin, and they set up, there's Quakers all over Ohio, um, Indiana, and literally they were inviting a people of color to come up, get out of the South, get away from all that oppression, and they started coming up north. So my family all took pretty much the same path. One side, or the Dungies and the Rickmans, they went to Tennessee first, to right where Nashville is in this area here, Sparta, Nashville. Stayed there for a while, but then on to Ohio, and on to Michigan. The others went Ohio, Indiana, Michigan, or just Ohio, Michigan. If you're from here, you probably recognize all those buildings there, these the local churches. Um, so my first ancestor to arrive in this township was Peter and Edith Day. We just talked about them. Uh, Lemuel's daughter, in that case. And they came here in 1849, so quite a bit before the Civil War. And so I can say, like, my mom still lives here. I live here now. Uh, as of one month ago, I moved here from Sacramento. But there's been someone in my family who's lived in Cass County continuously since 1849. And then all of my ancestors who did come to Calvin all came before the Civil War started. All so there were none. None of my family came as uh, Underground Railroad during the uh, as a slave to come up. They were all free already in the South. Uh, like I said, the only slave ancestor that I could find definitively was Samuel Hawks, who was on that, that cover. Um, but even, he, he got his freedom, at, at least from my research, I believe about nine years old, went to Ohio, and then came up to Michigan. As I said, the, you know, the richest person in Calvin, at least back in the 1800s. So again, if you know anything about this area, um, my ancestors all lived on what is now uh, Brownsville Road area, uh, Calvin Hill, uh, I can't think, I've been gone too long, the road off of M60 by the Benign House, turn left, what is that? Calvin Center. Oh, that's Center, yeah, all right. Okay, that's right, all right. And then all those churches, um, if you look at the original trustees, officers, members, you'll see the Days, the Pompeys, the Dungies, the Rickmans, the Hawks, they were all part of starting those churches. Okay, so looking at some photos, again, you'll, you'll kind of understand what I was talking about as far as like the racial makeup and just how different um, and very similar people look. So like these two here are, this is my great grandfather and his sister, half sister. So you have some Dungies, there's the Samuel Hawks picture, Dungie, it's my great grandmother when she was a little girl and that's 1899. Uh, he was a Dungie at the top. That's, this is Samuel Hawks again, the same person who's in that book, uh, Booker T. Washington book. But Mortimer Jeffries here, I mean, if you see some of these people, they look almost completely white. And some of the records I have, and I'll show one, uh, a letter that he wrote to, to when he was in Whitley County, Indiana, down by Fort Wayne. He actually sued the state because his kids couldn't go to school there. They were, um, they said, you know, no colored kids were going to go to school there. And he sued and won and got to go, uh, his kids got to go. The other thing, there was a couple other suits, they weren't allowed to vote. And it was because they wanted to vote Republican. And back then, you know, Abraham Lincoln was a Republican. They wanted to vote Republican. The Democrats weren't going to let them. And they sued and they won that as well. Another bunch of pictures. Some of these pictures are over here on the table too. Um, this is not a girl. That's my grandfather. Um, <laughs> so that's my, my mom's. Who my mom's up here? That's her dad, uh, Casper Pompey. Um, uh, this is my mom's uh, grandmother and grandfather. Uh, this is William Rickman and, and Elta Day. Uh, that was the same girl. That was the little girl in 1899. That was both right before their death. They actually. When they got married in uh, the early 1900s, he was 51 and she was 16. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. Lucky guy, I guess. 
<laughs> he outlived her uh, by about six months. So she died of a big, or, um, appendix bursting, and then I, he was already 81, and you know, maybe he just gave up. I don't know. Uh, this is a, a, a wonderful picture I have. This is my so. This is my grandfather in here, and his parents, so Castro Pompey, and then Richard Pompey, and Libby Pompey, who was last name was Gilbert. Um, and then this is her twin brothers, and they are identical twins, and I actually have the original picture, not a copy, but the original picture of that here. And they died right after that picture was taken, and so did she. Um, that was during the Spanish flu, that was during the World War I period. In fact, I actually have a photocopy of a handwritten letter that she wrote. She, six pages long, very interesting reading about the life here at Kelvin. Uh, it's, it's actually hilarious if you read it. And you can when you're, when you're done. Um, but they all, they both, all three died uh, around that time, as did a lot of people, uh, as you know, it took a huge percentage of the global population. Here's, now again, you, I know you can't see any of these things, but I do have uh, samples of those here. Those are newspaper articles from the Cassopolis Vigilant. And uh, they're, again, I think they're pretty funny. Uh, here's one from 1889, August 14th, 1888. So Samuel Hawks, the guy I showed you the picture, he says, Samuel Hawks has bought a new top buggy from French and Hayden of Cassopolis. I will say to some of the widows to keep a sharp lookout for the new buggy containing Samuel Hawks, for he will surely be around to pay you a visit soon. <laughs> I mean, news back then was not news today. You know, uh, there was stuff like, uh, you know, somebody hurt their knee and they're not feeling well, and that made the news. Um, let's see. Um, yeah. 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 Atkinson's bailer has been here this past week bailing hay at the barn of Samuel Hawks. John Kelly, one of the workmen, was thrown from a load of hay last Friday and was considerably hurt, but did not quit work. <laughs> That's good stuff. So, um, yeah, interesting reading. And again, the, the cast office vigilant are all there uh, to be looked at um, from the you know, late 1800s all the way until, I, I don't know, they might still have stuff on there uh, from the 2000s. But you, if you're from Calvin, your family is in there. So, in fact, I only, if you, if you notice here at the top, every one of these says, says Calvin. So, Calvin had their own section in the cast office vigilant. And the writer, who I don't know who it was, but his name was Nemo. And I'm sure that was a you know a pen name, but if you look at the bottom of all of them, sign Nemo. And there were some articles that are, again kind of funny how the people in Calvin would get mad at him and they'd write a letter to the editor and you know why Nemo is no good about this and then he would bash them back. Hilarious stuff. So uh, you know when we're done, come up and take a look at some of those. Oh yeah, that's the one that I just read about the the buggy and the widows being on the window. So this is the letter I was talking about um, where, and this is a, a letter that's in a plastic bag. It's from, as you can see, it's from December of 1860, Mortimer Jeffries, um, one of my ancestors there, that again was, was suing about his kids not being able to go to school, to the public school. Even though here in Calvin, the public school was completely integrated, even in the 1800s, black, white, Indian, whatever, all went to school together, and uh, no one cared. So this is that letter I was talking about. Again, a very interesting reading um, about actual life in December 1916 here in this town. Some of these other records, again, they're, they're really they're tough to see, so I'll kind of I'll breeze through them. But this is from the 28th day of July, 1823. And this is one of my um, but It says Dawson Pompey. His name was Dawson but he was a free man of yellow complexion, about 21 years of age. That was one of those papers when they had to go to the, the local counties, Brunswick County, Virginia, and sign in so they you know, didn't have to worry about getting stolen or sold back into slavery. Census records, if, if, again, if you get into genealogy, you're gonna have to love census records because that's how you start finding everybody. So I have a lot of those up here, and I've highlighted some that just, you know, census every 10 years, 1790 through 1940, is available um, for you to look at and find your family's history. I, I, on that side of the table, I have a lot of Civil War records, so again, we have someone from representing the 102nd 
color infantry. I had uh, several ancestors in that one. In fact, one of mine, Zachariah Pompey, uh, my three times great grandfather, this is over there, he was actually uh, arrested for desertion. So he never fought. Uh, even when they arrested him, they put him in jail, he ended up being sick the rest of the war. So, so uh, and I have that record too. So, and again, when I first started doing the research, I was told that he was a war hero, right? <laughs> no offense, that's, just, that's the kind of stuff that gets spread, but uh, he had to pay $35 too for his uh, being a deserter. Um, and then again, more, more records. Some of these are, they go all the way back to the 1700s. Um, uh, like somebody getting arrested, I had one ancestor who was arrested for rape, and that was actually listed um, in one of these 1750s um, documents. So this is my last slide, and I just really want to talk about finding your own story. So if you if you decide that you want to do this, one, I actually do live here in Kassopolis again, and I would be willing to help as far as I could. I do have a job too, and a family, but I would, I would be more than happy to help people. So one thing, again, you don't have to do what I did, spend the hundreds of hours. If you do want to do research, I always tell people when I used to conduct classes on how to do genealogy, you have to know someone alive that you know their first and last name and the county, and hopefully the township they lived in, in a, at a minimum 1940. But in some people in this room, that might be even them, or it might be your parents. So 1940, if, it, if your, you know, your parent was a person alive in Cass County, you just go to ancestry.com, or you can actually go on the old-fashioned route through the books, find that person. Once you find that person in 1940, you start working your way back. It's tedious, but it works. So right, even my, my mom, when I started this, or her mother was alive still, and I, she was born in 1914, it was easy to go to the 1920 census, and there she was as a six-year-old, instead of her parents. And you just work your way back. You look at what age they were, it says what age they were. So if they were 40 in 1820, then you gotta go back to 1880. And you start at that census, and you just keep working your way back. The only thing is, so the 1890 census, which is just a shame for people who are uh, enamored with genealogy like I am, is the 1890 census for the United States was destroyed. So the whole thing that is non-existent, it's destroyed the fire, so that is not available, other than there's a few counties that made it from a few states. But for the most part, that whole uh, census is gone. So that really is my uh, presentation. Uh, again, if you have any questions, I'll be glad to answer them now, or again, you can come up and take a look at my stuff, and I'll, I'll, I'm gonna move these tables all over so I can stand and answer questions as well. Thank you.